So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me. I thought I'd be in a room on my own talking. <laughs> it's, that's what it's like at home. My husband's there, but he's not listening. <laughs> so my, my name is Sylvia Watts Cherry, in case you didn't know. Uh, on Instagram, where is the only social media I'm quite active on, I'm with cherries on top too. And the title of the talk today is A Cultural and Creative Journey in Knitwear Design. So why cultural? Well, I'm going to tell you a story <laughs> and I will start at the beginning. So what I'm going to do is t tell you a little bit about my background and why getting inspiration from my cultural background is important to me. And then I'm going to show you a few of the designs and the inspirations behind them and how I was able to adapt it. So, and then I'll also be able to take questions if you've got any questions. I might not be able to answer them, but I will try my best to answer them. So that's the agenda for our little chat. And I'm going to show some photos in my PowerPoint. A lot of them belong to magazines, so they own the copyright, but they've kindly allowed me to use them because they're much better than my photos, so I thought it'd be better to show them off. So let's start at the beginning. So who am I and where did I come from, which is a question I'm always being asked and I never know how to answer them. So this is uh, the first top bit is a map of uh, Nigeria in West Africa. And the date is the date that the Nigeria got its independence from the UK. So I was born in 1962. So two years after independence, I arrived. And while, while I, when I arrived, a few years after, my parents left to travel to study. My, my dad, they went to Russia where my dad did his PhD. Meanwhile, my sister and I were being looked after by my paternal grandmother. During the time they were away, the Biafran War began. So most of the time, so it began in 1967, so I was about five years old. I was just before my fifth birthday. I don't have any recollection of my parents. I didn't have a visual, I didn't know who they were. My sister and I just stayed with my grandmother. And while we were growing up, I felt very different from the children around because they had their parents. We didn't have anybody except my grandmother. She did her best, but it wasn't the same as having your parents there. And I knew my parents were alive, but I didn't know what they looked like. I didn't have any... I didn't remember being cuddled or held or anything. So that was my early childhood. The war finished in January 1970, and in 1970, January, we went to Aberdeen in Scotland, where my parents were living. My dad was a research scientist there. And so it was just about the war. If you can imagine, I'd been born and brought up till I was seven in Nigeria. It was hot very hot, arrived in January in Aberdeen. <laughs> if you've ever been to Aberdeen, it's freezing. It's absolutely freezing. I remember coming off the plane and being huddled with these coats and I was still shivering. And the, my parents were strangers to us because we didn't know them. So growing up in the 1970s in Aberdeen was very, very, very strange as a child. We were the only non-white family. We were the only black family. And again, if you remember, I'd come from Nigeria. I didn't even know what white people looked like. I'd never met anybody except black people. So then, so I've come all the way from the heat to the cold, from familiar environment to an area where most people were kind, 
but I didn't understand the rules of living there. I didn't even speak the language. So we were, my parents wanted us to integrate and in that we had to speak English at home as well so that we would learn it quicker. And what that meant was I stopped understanding and speaking the language I was born with. So I felt like as a child that I didn't belong anywhere, everything had been taken away. I remember moving to school, we used to, I was brought up in the countryside outside Aberdeen and I remember moving to the big school and they asked me where I'd come from. So I gave them the name of the town I'd just come from and everybody laughed and I didn't understand. <laughs> and it was like, well, you can't come from there, you don't come from there. So from a, growing up, it was, there was a lot of anxiety about where did I belong to? Who did I belong to? Who, you know, who am I? So for me, culture and identity are very much intertwined. I just didn't know who I was. Knitting, how do we get back to knitting? So I learned to knit when I was at primary school. And those of you who might remember the 1970s, well, in Scotland, in Aberdeen in the 1970s, the girls did home economics. Boys did whatever the boys were doing. They weren't doing home economics. It was always fun what they were doing, but we did home economics. So we had to learn how to sew as well and how to knit. And in those days, knitting was not an activity young people said they did. It was for grannies. And we didn't actually value handmade things in those days. You would never dream of going to school and telling people somebody knitted your jumper. You'd, I would hide my jumper rather than wear it to school. Um, so I, I learned to knit, but I loved it. For me, there was a rhythm that calmed me down. I found calmness in knitting. It just became like a form of therapy for me. I could stop thinking while I was knitting. So that was the place knitting had for me. So spring forward, I got married, brought my children up. Meanwhile, I'd moved to near London. I moved to Hertfordshire in England, which is where I live now. So I, growing up, I still felt different because now everybody says, you're Scottish. I said, no, but the Scots didn't tell me I was Scottish. And I said, but you are, because you, you've got an accent. I said, no, but when I was there, they told me I wasn't. So I don't know who I am. So we, I had the children. We had a biz, family business. In 2016, we sold the business. And I felt that I needed to go out and meet people. So I returned back into knitting. And when I joined the knitting group, I was surprised young people owned up to knitting. It wasn't just they owned up to it. There were things like knitting festivals. There were things like indie dyed yarn, which I'd never heard of. So I got into um, festivals and started to feel a sense of connection with a group. And then in 20... 18, things started happening. I don't know if you remember, there was a lot of discussion in the knitting world about representation and everything. And for me, that was a time of stress. I was very anxious because it was like I was suffering from PTSD. I was suffering a little bit of trauma, like, oh my gosh, I thought we were all in this together. Where do I fit in? I, I, I don't know. It started to bring back a feeling of, who are you? Where do you fit in? Where do you belong? My husband's white. My children are mixed race. So when there's all the discussion, I'm thinking, I'm, am I with the white people? Am I with the black people? Who do I fit in with? So that was a lot of trauma. And I felt that I didn't have the connection to say I belonged in any group. And so I went to this Africa Utopia event in the South Bank in London with one of my daughters. And as I approached the building, I could hear the drums. 
the rhythmic talking drums of Africa. And it was exciting. I wanted to go in. And then the smells, the aroma of food that I'd remembered, but I hadn't eaten for such a long time. It was, it just made me feel like I was going home. And then when I opened the doors and started to go down these stairs, there was just this color everywhere and patterns and the vibrancy of it. It just made me feel so excited. And I just stood there and had this, you know in TVs when they have this eureka moment and there's a light bulb, that's exactly what it felt like. I stood there and said to my daughter, oh my God, why is nobody doing this? I could see patterns, I could see colors that maybe people wouldn't mix together, but they felt right to me. And that's what I wanted to, to be. I said, I need to do this. I need to include some African patterns into knitwear because that would make me feel happy and connected to something that I hadn't realized I had. And that was the journey into getting a form of connection with my culture. So for me, and like most people, when you think of African fabrics, you go towards the African wax prints. To me, that's what African fabrics looked like. Exciting colors and traditional because they've been sold in West Africa, Central Africa, since the um, Industrial Revolution. So it was traditional. It was something I knew. They were used by all the different um, classes of people, from farmers to wealthy royals, and they were used in the wrapper, you know, the African cloth you tie, women tie around them. And they were used in things like fans and Western fashions. So they were contemporary as well. And so I started off looking at these as a way of looking at the patterns within them, saying, I can include some of these. I can see how I can put them into knitwear. And that chance to do that came about with the Kersey Allsop's Handmade Christmas Show in 2018. I was approached by one of the um, researchers and I thought, ooh, I've never done this sort of thing. I mean, I've always knitted and I've always adapted patterns, but I didn't think of myself as a designer. I just thought of myself as a knitter. I mean, knitting's what I do. It's, you know, I don't do fancy pantsy things like designing. But I thought, oh, well, you know what? What are you doing anyway? I like to challenge myself. And I thought I was designing something for my daughter who's very graceful, very beautiful. And I thought, I'm going to make this. She's going to look amazing. And so I signed the contract and then they said, it's for you. So no, no. <laughs> but I thought, okay, so I'll do that. So I looked for an African fabric that I recognized. And this was one of them. I don't know if you've seen this sort of fabric, but it's very common in lots of different countries in Africa and they've got different names. So in Ghana, it has a name that translates to water well, because what they see is that these resemble the ripple effect when a stone is thrown into water. In Nigeria, it's called plak plak or record, because it resembles a vinyl record. And there's other names in other countries. And what I wanted to do was to put some vibrant colors in Christmas jumpers. So, I mean, when I think of Christmas jumpers, I think, tend to think of snow, snowman, green. And I'm thinking, there ain't Christmas jumpers in Africa because they can't, so snowman is going to be meaningless. But what I thought was I could use this and see it as like a Christmas bauble on a Christmas tree. So that's what I played with, and this was the, what was the outcome. So that was, so we've got the Christmas tree, 
with the bobbles hanging from them. So that was what I did. That's just because I wanted to do something in the back. But So I was really chuffed to bits trying to work from a brief. I'd never worked from a brief before to a deadline, and it just seemed fun. So I thought, I'd like to do that again if there's another opportunity. And the next opportunity that was arise came in January 2019. And in 2019, I was going to New York for the Vogue Knitting Live. So I told you, when I discovered knitting events, I just wanted to go to all of them. And when it meant going to places I'd never been to, that was exciting. So I booked to go to New York. And I thought, if I go to New York, I need something bold and brassy. <laughs> I thought, I want something that represented the new me, the new foundling. I was finding myself and feeling confident to show me as I was, a black woman, a big black woman with a voice that laughed loud and didn't, wasn't un apologetic about it. I wanted something that would represent me. So I thought of a design. So I wanted something. This woman was definitely a black woman. She had her traditional gear. She was unapologetic about who she was. So my idea was to, was to, con was conceived as a jumper. And I thought, I really want a jumper. That's one of my daughters. And um, when I did it, I thought, as you know, I have a fan. I am one of those women at that age where I sweat all the time. I can't even call it glowing because I just sweat like a pig. So, so I thought, I can't wear a jumper because I'm just going to sweat. So I thought, I'll make it into a cardigan. So I thought, I have to put the face at the back of the cardigan. And I thought, oh, but I want it at the front. I want when people see me, they see this thing coming towards them, not behind me. So I thought, okay, I'll make it to a card again. But I thought, the band is going to lose the face. And so what I did was I decided to turn it into an intarsia knit so that when you close it, you could still see the face. So it was the cardigan, and I could wear it loose, and you got the picture at the back, or you could have it. And that was what, and I'm happy to show you the, look at those. There's, I wove in all my ends. Um, <laughs> and this, the Nubian Queen was what resulted, and the Nubian Queen put me into um, everybody's, well, not everybody, a lot of people noticed, Vogue noticed, and Pom Pom, Lane magazine, they noticed because nobody was doing intarsia knitting and they saw that and it opened a lot of doors for me. But once I'd found these um, fabrics, the wax prints, I started delving into it a bit more. And then I found out that although they're traditionally African, and they're produced a lot in Africa, they're not African. The history is that they're Dutch. And in fact, the designs that are most popular, uh, they're still produced, like the one I use, are owned by the Dutch company. So all the profit is still Dutch, and none of it is African. And that worried me a bit because I thought, does that mean that a culture that I thought was mine is adopted again? I need to find something that I'm not borrowing, but is genuinely mine. So I started to delve into um, indigenous African tribal art, textiles, artifacts. And that led me to the um, British Museum in London and also some books. And what I was finding was that there was generations of people, very talented people, but like all 
crafters, we don't value what we have or what we do. We give them away for very little. We don't appreciate that we may have a skill. And so much of it has been dis gone. And so if you don't write your own history, nobody knows you existed. And so I was finding things that made me feel proud and I could connect really well into them. And so I'm going to show you and some other things. So we saw some fabrics. Most of these are from the west of Africa, which Nigeria is. Saw some pottery. I was recognizing certain shapes that I was seeing a lot of. Diamonds, triangles, um, doors. These are carvings as well. They seem to have certain shapes that were regular. And some of the designs that started coming up were... So this one's one that... You can see some, so those lines. So this is sort of based around this area. It's from an area in Nigeria, Akwete, so the tribes. So this was one I did for Lane magazine. Right, so this one I called Aqua Miri. And what you'll find is a lot of the designs I did, I named and drew um, inspiration from African tribes. I gave African names because I wanted to pay homage to where they've come from. And uh, some of the magazines will change the names, but Lane kept, kept the name. So Aqua Miri literally means um, cloth of the water, which is really a towel. But it sounds nice as aqua Mary, doesn't it? <laughs> so you have the lines with some of the geometric designs around it. So that was a cardigan with pockets in it. Something in that pocket, I didn't even know. <laughs> okay, so that's one. And then we, I also have another one here. So this one's a, just to show, I don't just do intarsia. This one is a stranded, knitted in the round scarf. And a lot of the influence is um, Kente fabric from Ghana. So a lot of the designs have come through from Kente. And most of these have got, sim they're symbolic. A lot of the symbol have um, meaning, which is one of the things that I've found really exciting to be working with that you can have a design and a pattern and it will make a nice knitwear but there's a deep meaning behind it um, you know usually quite spiritual love and all of that sort of thing so this one I called Morawi and uh, Morawa sorry and Morawa in the Ghanaian language that it came from means queen so that's what that one is and this one was done for a company, uh, Brambles and Me, who did um, natural dyeing. And they asked me if I could make a pattern for their Christmas advent. So that's what I came up with for it. So that's that one. And then the next one is this one here, which is... Uh, which disappointed me. This one was done for the Kate Davis and Jeanette Sloan Warm Hands book. They asked if I could design something for them. And I used, this doesn't fit me, which is embarrassing, <laughs> but it fits smaller hands. Um, so it's, I used a lot of the African symbols around it just to give it that ethnic feel. And, but the annoying thing is when it went in the book, I said, this is the top bit, and they dressed it so that was on the top. And every time I look at it in the book, I go, they've got it the wrong way around. <laughs> they couldn't they see? They had bubbles here, but not there. So that, that, this one I called Amaka. And Amaka comes from my tribe, the Igbo tribe in Nigeria. And Amaka is the shortened name it's a girl's name, Chiamaka, which is God. Um, chi, chi means God, but um, 
I called it a maca, which means in Igbo. I should know this, but I can't remember. It means beautiful, beautiful. Um, so chia maca is God is beautiful. But okay, so gosh, it's hot. So those are a few of the patterns. So now I'm going to just go through some designs which I used and then how I adapted them. So this one is the Mino. It's the Mino vest. So if I just show you. So it's a, I used to, I call these a tank top, but they're called um, pullover vests. <laughs> so this one, the origins of the design was from um, a pot from Benin. Um, so it was a, sorry, a bronze sculpture from Benin in West Africa. And the, in the days of, it was called Dahomey. And the Dahomey tribe used, the kings used women as their warriors. And you'll recognize that in the Black Panther film, if you watched it, or the um, woman king. They had very powerful, ferocious women as warriors, and they were the, they were the elite to look after the kings. So when I saw this pattern, I liked it. And I thought, I wonder what it'll look like sideways. So I turned it 90 degrees, and I liked the swirly patterns. So I designed this based on it. So the swirly patterns are still there with the lines. You can see them there. But I then took some of the other shapes and I just did something a little bit fancier with it because I didn't want to copy that exactly. I wanted it to be something. Again, this is um, done in stranded rather than in tarsier. When I finished it, I actually thought it looked like an armor top, for a, which is why I gave it the warrior's name. And I called it Mino. And in the language, it means our mother. That's what Mino means, our mother. So they used to call the women warriors our mother, because they looked after everybody. That's that one again. That's my daughter modeling it. I always get my daughters to model everything, so I think they're cheap. <laughs> Do they keep any of the jumpers? Well, they're supposed to, but I just keep saying, I need the samples. So they've given up asking me to knit anything. They say, Mom, it's not worth asking you because you never give it to us. So I know. <laughs> So the next one I did was, um, I looked at, this, is, this was a COVID project actually. Um, during COVID, I struggled a lot with being locked up in a house and I'd already agreed to a few things. One of them was pom-pom, so I designed this for pom-pom. And I just kept thinking, I just don't feel inspired and I've got to come up with things. And I found this design from a Cuba, um, K-U-B-A pattern. So Cuba was a group of people from the, um, Congo, the Congo. And they had these sort of patterns that were geometric. And a lot of them didn't repeat, but some looked like they repeat, like this one. I really did like that shape. And at the time, when they told me what their brief was, which was home or something like that, I just felt that this was symbolic of travel, the way that life isn't straight, but zigzags. So that's how that made me feel that, and I thought there's enrichments throughout your life, but you journey through life and travel here, travel there, and get to know different people. Um, originally, I played with a few bright colors I had at home. Um, so when they saw it, they said they really liked it, but it was a bit difficult. Could I simplify it? Because it was going to be in Tarsia. So I said, okay, what I can do is I'll remove the stripes. And so I did. 
and I think I kept most of the rest. So this is what came, happened. This is how it ended up. So we simplified it a lot. But I still said I want to knit this version. <laughs> but yeah, that was our next version. So that was my COVID knit. And that's the journey. And it actually made the front cover, which was really made me chuffed and proud. I thought I have to put that in as well. <laughs> so the next thing I wanted to talk about was Amina. Right. So Amina is another name. Um, it hasn't got any massive significance other than it's, it was a name that was African. And what these are, these are my inspiration. The, all these beautifully coloured beaded things are coverings for the pubic area for women. Um, I, did, I was asked by La and me if I could do something for their worsted book. And I said, yes, I can give you pubic coverings. <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I said, but just don't tell people that's what it is. And what I liked about these shapes was, I, first, again, you can see the diamond shape. Um, in fact, the diamond is, I mean, it's in all, all cultures, but they're symbolic. Uh, so diamonds in some cultures in Africa means you're a woman, a married woman. So you'd only wear those if you were a married woman. So these were coverings for females. And... Um, I quite liked the diamond shape, and when I was given the wool to play with, I thought, well, I could do texture. I just felt the wool, um, wool needed some, could work with texture, and I wanted to do some cable. I wanted to do quite a lot of things, but I wanted to also do the diamonds. But the brief was, well, somebody else is doing cables. I said, but I want to do cables. <laughs> <laughs> so. I produced Amina, which is, this is um, La Biennemi's worsted yarn. So we have a few versions of that. She wanted, um, so that's me playing with some ideas and colors and things. And then we, and I just didn't know what to choose. So she helped me choose the colors. So that's how we ended up. So I, I, because I had so much wool, I decided to make a cowl as well. Um, but this, is our Amina and there are two lengths to the Amina. This was the longer length and Amy made a more adult version according to my daughter. That's Amy with her version which was more like browns and more browns and more browns whereas mine's candy. So that's, that was Amina. But I liked Amina, and I just thought, well, I like this, but they're not, they're probably a little bit subtle for me. So I need to have my own version. So this is mine. <laughs> so this is my version. I just thought, I did simplify, I think I made it a bit, I can't remember what I adapted. I, I knitted this in a rush. But what I did, I have plain backs because I thought a lot of people complain about doing the intarsia, which I, I don't mind. I carried the yarn to make it a bit less ends to weave in, because you can. Um, but I wanted a little bit of interest in the sleeves, so I put a different rib there. So it's not a normal rib rib. It's a little bit different. So that was Amina. With your inspiration and in terms of pictures of pottery and materials, is there any history in Africa of knitting or something similar? I, I couldn't find it? any. The only thing is weaving. weaving yes. And yeah, and the, this one here was from, I mean, this is. I looked at the weaving from my part of the world and I thought they were boring. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, why do we do plain things and all the others do nicer ones? <laughs> so no, it's more, because I guess because of the temperature, there wouldn't be need for wool, but 
linen, cotton, there's a lot of work on that. So Lots of Africa can get terribly cold. Yes, I guess um, the past, uh, because of my history, I've tended to deal mostly with the West mm -hmm. and I'm trying to push yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to push it a bit, but there's so much that I haven't even taken, a, a, I haven't done much and I've still found lots and lots. If and if I stuck to one country, I mean, it's my dream to visit the villages, to actually find out what they have, you know, whether they still do these crafts and whether, but it's something I probably will never do. There's probably lots of dangers associated with travel on your own, and I'm not that brave. So it was, but it is a dream, because I'm sure there are lots of crafts that are not seen, you know. Do you find that your, your designs and your works is resonating with women like of yourself? Black. Yes, okay. yeah. A lot of people think I'm American because the American market is where my biggest audience is. And I get a lot of um, interest from companies in America to come and then to find out what the travel costs would be. Because <laughs> they genuinely think, oh, I thought you were American. I said, do I sound American? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it, it's a lot. It's really very interesting. I just think, I wish I was more creative. There's so much I would love to do that I don't have the skills to do. And, you know, people say, why do you do so much in Tarsia? And the reasons that a lot of the patterns I find are not repeatable enough in the two colours. Because in stranded knitting, you can't have such long strands. And some of the patterns need the colour to make them work. So that's why I've done a lot of intarsia. Also, I do like it. But it, that's why, really, you know, just thinking if I had this and I just had to stick with two colours, it wouldn't be the same. It would probably be easier. And you wouldn't have the flexibility that you have with intarsia because with my stranded, my tension changes when I'm stranding. So, so the next thing I did, which I haven't got the sample back yet, is another one for Pom Pom. Um, for the 10th anniversary, they asked if I would submit a pattern. Um, I think because when they were doing, looking back, I'd done something that hadn't been done by a lot of people with intarsia, so they wanted me to be in their 10th anniversary. And so I thought, okay, how do I come up with an inspiration? I think there are some designers who are real designers, who I call real designers, and they have a bank of designs that's just waiting for that commission. I don't. I wait and then I think, oh my God, what am I going to do here? So what I had was a bracelet. I didn't bring it today, but it's at home. Um, it's a beaded bracelet, which my daughter's brought back from South Africa. And um, so I thought I could use that. Um, again, I did not name it Paragon. The Pom Pom named it Paragon, so I left it to them. And what I was, at the time, I was looking at, I know like, you were asking about the equator and stuff like that. This one's come from South Africa, the beads, the, the Mbedwe, I, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Ndebele people of South Africa, they love their bead work. And I love beads, I love beaded earrings, I love beaded bracelets. And when I started looking at the beads, there were patterns I could play with. And I used this primarily. And then I, this was because I just thought that space is boring. I need to put something in it because it's boring to me. So it must be boring to other people. So I just played about till I got a shape I liked um, and then sent them the brief and they liked it. So they said, okay. So this is Paragon. So now I, it was knitted in two versions. 
This was my version, the pink, of course, pink. But this is the one I actually prefer. <laughs> it wasn't knitted by me. And when they showed me, I went, oh, I wish I'd knitted that one, because that's my favorite. <laughs> And that one made the cover, so I was pleased. But that's the one I prefer. And the, what they've done is they've not used as many colors. They've used one less color than I did for the pink version. Uh, but I love, this was chink fiber yarn. The other one was La Bienname. So, but they're both nice, but I did think that's the one. I wish I'd made that one. Now, the other thing I found a lot from looking at these indigenous arts was the storytelling of tribal storytelling in pictures. And I remember, you know, there aren't many things I remember from living in Nigeria because when I remember the insecurity when the armies were attacking the village and we had to flee. So there was lots of we have to go, we have to go. And as a sideline, I remember this day. I, could, I mean, I left when I was five, so God knows how old I was. No, it started when I was five and it finished in 1970, so I was seven and a half when I left. So I have no idea how old I was, but my grandmother used to go to market to do trading. You know, that, that's, she, that's what she did to make some money. And I remember there was all this talk about the soldiers were going to attack and everybody was packing and fleeing. And I was thinking, my sister is a year younger than me. And I was thinking, what do we do? My grandma's not here. What shall we do? And we kept going to the river edge because she went across the river on, on a boat. And I was thinking, what shall we do? What shall we do? And I remember when she, I remember saying to my sister, We'll wait a bit longer, and if she doesn't come, we'll go. We'll go with other people. And she came just in time and smacked me hard for daring to even think of going away. What will your father say to me? <laughs> I, I thought I was doing the right thing. <laughs> it's like, we've got time. We will go in the evening when it's dark. But I remember this storytelling in the evenings where lots of different generations would sit around the fire and there'll be lots of telling stories. So there's lots of things, little things I remember. And it was, I wanted to replicate this, the storytelling in the form of knitting. And I was going to the last um, 2020 Vogue knitting and I wanted to have something, because I'd already had this splash with the Nubian Queen. I thought, well, I can't go in grey. This will just be too embarrassing. So this is where the village life came in. And it was designed to have a whole of a, a paranomic um, picture, so it goes all the way around. So when I designed it, I used inspiration from these paintings, again, that I found in the British Museum. And I started the design from the back. And then, see if I can wear this without, God. I'm probably going to roast now, but I'll wear it to show you. So when I designed it, I wanted the picture to be all around. I've put on a bit of weight as well, but here we go. So I started it from the back. And then I wanted it to come round and so when I did this, I drew it from the back in this massive chart, and I knitted the back, happy, knitted this part, happy. Then I started knitting this bit, and I got up to here, and I thought, I'm just going to try to put, pin it together and just try it, just to see. And I tried it, and I went, they're telling a different story. They have to look like they belong to the same garment. They just look different. So although I'd knitted up to here, by the way, this is John Arben, knit by number. <laughs> so is this one. This is four ply. Um, so I knitted up to here, I tried it, I thought. <sighs> Individually, this went with the back and this went with the back, but they didn't go together. So I had to redesign the whole of this side so that we could get a picture that flowed 
around and looked like it belonged to the same scenery. And I've still got that piece I knitted because I never rip anything back. I have to go and buy more wool. So I bought more wool and I knitted it again. So that was the story of this one. So that was the village life. It was, there was nowhere. I've met people, designers from South Africa. I've met people from the Caribbean. And they all tell me that I must have used a picture from their town or village. I said, no, it's made up. I said, you wouldn't get, what is it, elephants or whatever they are. They wouldn't get bears coming that close to people. That's just not. So, yeah. But what I wanted to do is the storytelling of people sitting together, pounding yarn. Where are they pounding yarn? Is it in the back? Oh, sorry. Is it in the back? I can't even remember. They're pounding yarn in the back. Right. They're going to market. People are sitting, chatting. I just wanted that sort of storytelling. And that's what that was about. So that's the last sample. Sorry, I have to take strip off. Excuse me. <laughs> it's so hot. Um, again, I wove in my ends because I don't mind weaving in. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, thank you I took about two, three weeks. It's in double knitting. And the thing is, when people said to me, oh, I like doing stocking stitch because it's so calming, I find stocking stitch very stressful, very stressful to knit because I never, my mind is always active. I never stop thinking. The only time I stop thinking is when I'm asleep. So for me to knit something like this, I'm paying attention to the chart, so I switch off. But if I'm knitting something like socks in the round, it just goes round and round. And if it's a jump, oh my God, it goes round and round, and I just can't stop the anxiety that comes with that. So this doesn't take me long because I just enjoy knitting intarsia. And I want to see the things appear. So it knits up fast. So that's what that one is. So how, you know, how do I do design? Well, I look for inspiration. That's my daughter again in New York. So here's one that I, uh, inspiration I found. This is a um, Bamiliki elephant mask from tribe that is from Cameroon in, again, the west side. And I just thought it was beautiful and colorful. And I looked at this and I thought, this could be um, colored intarsia cables, or I could just do it as normal knitted stocking cable, stocking um, shapes, stocking stitch shapes. And I just love that. So I started playing with the chart. So I made a chart and then I started knitting a swatch and came up with this. So this was, I was just playing with this, and then there was this. But as I was knitting, I kept saying to my husband, I'm not sure about this. He says, oh, it's all right. Look, it's nice. You just keep playing with it. I said, there's something not right. I said, look, I can't do this anymore. So I said, well, look at this. I mean, just look at this. I said, I cannot put out a jumper with nipples on them. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I said, whichever way I had it, it was just coming out as nipples. I thought, no. So I had to abandon this. So this is work in progress, and it will become something. I might actually have to do it, but without these, because that's what was giving me. I think if I took those off, it might, I'm not sure. It still looks a bit You've too. Got it in your head, I've got it in my head, it won't go away. No, it won't go away. So that is my finale. I am open to questions if you have any. Or have I stunned you into silence? <laughs> It's with cherries on top, too, as in T-O-O. Right. I, when I was thinking of uh, an Instagram name, 
I thought, it has to be meaningful. So I thought, well, what's Cherry is my surname. So with Cherry sounds a little bit like that. And I thought, I'm living life with cherries on top. So I thought, with cherries on top, too. So that's how that name came about. So some of the other things I've done are the... Because I do also use my Scottish upbringing as... Because I feel I'm in a unique position to take on. And that's one of the conclusions I came to in the end, that I can accept my heritage because it's mine and the, nobody can take that away. But I was also brought up in Scotland, so I can accept that too, because I did live in Scotland, so I also can design a <laughs> cow, which is my one. And this one is actually a missed opportunity, because you know you normally saw in your end, I didn't, because I was rushing to do this one in a week. You should have on the outside. I should, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Wouldn't that just be the right thing for the cow to have? That was a missed opportunity. I was trying to... So the... Yeah. 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 So the actual sample that went to the magazine is all nicely done. But I'm, I'm thinking what I might do is just take all the ends and push them back. That's, that's why I haven't finished it. Do you, not, do you not see a sort of strange sort of symmetry between some of the African traditional designs and shapes mm -hmm. as is seen in shepherd knitting? Yes. I yeah, mean, our mm -hmm. colours are very muted yes, because yes, we live in a yes, muted yes, surrounding. Yes, yes, yes. But there's a lot, I've noticed, there's a lot of similarities in so many different cultures and so many different um, indigenous people have come up. And it just shows how the travelling around that people did and took ideas from each other. And we need to celebrate them all. You know, it's important to celebrate them all, um, but not see it as just this or just that. Um, so, yes, I started to notice things. In fact, one design I did for an American magazine, somebody wrote in to the company and said that I was misappropriating um, the indigenous Indian, uh, um, Native American design. And so they wrote to me to ask me if I could tell them what my inspiration was because they wanted to answer the letter properly. And I got really upset. I said, what? I've done all this work. So I sent them a whole load of stuff and they said, thank you. And I said, they don't even know who I am to say that. You know, they didn't know who I was. They hadn't looked into my background. They just saw this and they said that the, the magazine was typically middle class white woman magazine. Therefore, whoever they had designed in it must have misappropriated it. I thought, oh, dear God, <laughs> dear, dear, dear. You know, we all have, I think the great thing about knitting is that it can unite us all. In fact, craft can unite us all. We all share creativity and nobody owns it. You know, you can, nobody, you can do, Diff take one stitch and do different things to it. It doesn't mean to say you owned it, because other people would have come up with the same idea. They may not have published it. So, yeah, we celebrate everybody. Mm. And the reality is that a lot of these crafts and knitting in particular has like hundreds of years in various different yes. areas, and that as people have moved around, it's been absorbed in a variety mm. of different ways. Yes. And you know, with the wonderful way that we have now, mm -hmm. but, I mean, it's, I don't think any design is truly one thing or another. No. Yes. You know, there are elements yes. of it. Yes. You know, so like for, for yourself, it's very much rooted in, in what you've discovered about your African mm -hmm. um, background, but the actual techniques of very it's, uh, universal. Atmosphere. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and for me, it's a journey of self acceptance. And so, if I can share it with others, 
and they can celebrate with me, it makes me feel good that I've done something. I'm an accidental designer. I wasn't by intent. <laughs> so I am definitely not a designer because I can't draw to save your life. It takes me hours to come up with anything. If I ask what might be a difficult question, mm -hmm. um, you explained at the beginning how you were struggling with your, your position in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you were in that time in, in Aberdeen, living with your parents. Yes. Did they not eat your traditional food from Ghana and well, from Nigeria. Uh, uh, Nigeria, sorry, yeah. and teach you about no. Nigeria? But we right. did eat some. Ask, we did eat some food. I just didn't know how to make it when I left, but I did, we did eat some. But in order to integrate, I think what the became was we became more British than British. You know, we celebrated. We didn't celebrate our differences because we didn't want to be different. We wanted to be like fit in, and so I think that's the danger, especially for a child that you then feel shame about the diff things that make you different. And it's now in later life that I actually appreciate that those differences is what makes me stand out. In an industry where you want to stand out, I stand out. And that has been to my benefit. I don't look like anybody else or knit like anybody else. But as a youngster, and the difficult thing was that I couldn't tell my friends because they didn't understand. They were my friends. They said they loved me. And I have been fortunate to enjoy lifelong friendship with them. But they never knew how lonely it was to be Is feeling it outside. Are you curious about your previous life? No. No, I'm I just be, being the most curious person yeah. in the whole world. I find them hot. Yeah. Well, I guess they just saw me. We were just friends. And there at the moment, you just play. You don't, you know, as a seven, eight year old, you I don't think. Yes. Yeah. 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 You're just someone to play with. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think the 70s Aberdeen, 80s Aberdeen was a very different world to what it is now. It is. It's very much. I mean, yeah, my brothers, th my one brother's there, my sister's there, my parents are still there, and things are very different. But at the time, it just felt very... People weren't cruel, as I said, but they were cruel in the how they behaved, but they didn't know they were... They felt they were being interested. But when, as a child, you go into a bus and the whole bus turns around to look at you, you just feel that there's... that. You feel that there's something wrong with you. You know, it's a bit sad. And I don't mean this to be a sad story, <laughs> but that's how it was. And that's, I wanted to just show how my knitting be has become important to me because it's my way of connecting to a sense of self that I didn't have and also a sense of belonging to something that wasn't borrowed, but is something that's in me. So. I was going to say that that works the other way as well because I went to I went to Ghana with a friend. We, uh -huh. we had the unusual. We both went to college. We looked like sisters, but we're not. Uh huh. But we we you know we are both sort of mixed mixed race. Yes. And so, but we when we went to Ghana, of course they they thought of us as white. Yes. yes. Yeah. And they also thought we were twins. So we walked in the market and everyone was shouting, "Oh, really twins? Oh, really twins? Oh, yes. 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 oh, really twins? All down the market. Everybody was staring at us, thinking yes. we were twins. Yes. We weren't related at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you were mixed me. But it was in quite, we had some odd surprises because both of our mothers are librarians. <laughs> and both of our fathers did Laura at university. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and you found awesome. each other. Yeah. I mean, I think people mistook each other, mistook us for each other yes. when we were at college. And we weren't at college anywhere near where we lived. We were in wow. a different kind of all wow. places. And people kept mistaking us for each other. And that's actually how we met. Because uh -huh. we said, oh, you're the person people keep <laughs> wow. But yeah. it was it, it probably it was it was very fun, but it was also quite it was, it was also quite strange because you're the you're the, and also you're suddenly completely white. Yes, yes. Whereas yes, yes. And it is a it's a hard position being I think being mixed. 
because you think, where do I fit in, really? But I think as the world is becoming more open and the people, there are more and more mixed race people, yeah. you know, which is the way it should be. We should, the world's full of colour and we should celebrate it. But um, yeah, I think it wasn't, I think it was the fact that it was all the time. You, had, you couldn't be anonymous. If you were shy, like my sister was very shy, she struggled very much being so public. Whereas I don't mind. <laughs> I'm, I celebrate my loudness. I, I bring it on. But I still felt strange to have people looking at you and thinking, what have I done? Why are they looking at me? So that was, but it was just all the time. Because we were, you know, I would probably have done the same. You know, I'm not saying I'm different, because it was new. It was something unusual. But when you're a child, you just want to fit in and just be bland and be anonymous. You don't want people to notice you. So that, that, I think that was it. It's just, it wasn't necessarily them. After all, perhaps if I'd had the better relationship at home, it might have been easier. But having those years of no attachment, I think it was telling as I got older because I was very independent, I, because I relied on me. And that's probably the difficulty. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you. Sharing. You're welcome. It's so really design journey. You are an actual designer. Oh, thank you. I don't have a pile of stuff that I've designed. So, absolutely. <laughs> 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 thank you. Yeah. I was actually surprised when I put in things together. I thought, I've done quite a bit. I have to shot. I have, I, how do I contain this? So, yes, it's amazing what you can do. And this is my retirement, people. <laughs> I suppose I am retired. Oh, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.